Buenas tardes. Um, soy Trisha. No hablo español. Um, I am a technical agricate, I mean advocate for um, JetBrains. They make IntelliJ IDEA. Um, who's using IntelliJ IDEA? Nice. For Groovy? Okay, cool. Um, which leads me to, so this is a Groovy conference, uh, I hope. Um, who is actually using Groovy? Quite a lot of you. And some of you, I assume, are here to learn more about Groovy? Or not? I don't know who the rest, what are the rest of you doing here? <laughs> I just thought you'd wander around on a Saturday. Um, okay, and who's using Spock already? Oh, wow, loads of you. Okay, so I might skip over some of the basics of Spock, but... Um, Okay, who wants to learn more about the basics of Spock? Okay, I won't then, fine. <laughs> just, just gauge it correctly. Uh, so yes, so this is a talk about Spock. Um, this is a talk based on a real case study. I used to work for MongoDB, and um, we went through a process of figuring out our tests, which obviously, I'm now telling you my talk before I tell you the talk. But the idea is to show you a real use case of where we're using Spock to test a genuine library. So if you want to, you can go to GitHub and actually look at that code and see the Spock tests and see the state of the tests that aren't Spock. Um, so a bit about my background. I used to work for a company called LMAX Exchange. Um, thank you for the shout out this morning. <laughs> um, we invented something called the Disruptor. But um, that's not really the important thing. The important thing is we were a financial exchange. Um, reliability, performance, and absolute correctness of the code was very, very important because other people's money depends upon it. So I was used to doing things uh, with test-driven design, i.e. you write the tests first, and that implies what the design of your system will be, not just um, implies the development. Um, we also had acceptance, integration, system, performance, and unit tests. We had all these different levels of testing, and they were done with slightly different frameworks. So for example, the unit tests were JUnit, the acceptance tests were our own DSL, which allowed us to write much more um, descriptive high-level tests, which exercised the whole system. And really importantly about this is that because we did pair programming, we had a very clear understanding, shared understanding, of what each of those tests were, <coughs> when you use unit tests, when you use acceptance tests, um, and how to write the best versions of these tests. So I come from this background, um, I spent four years working at LMAX, where we did everything the right way. And then I went to move, I worked for MongoDB. <laughs> Don't laugh. Um, and MongoDB is a different beast. Not, I'm not saying MongoDB is, is worse or anything, it's just an entirely different sort of thing. So instead of working for a financial exchange where we had complete control of all of our code, we knew how it was used in production, we had control of the hardware, we knew exactly what happened with our system and therefore we could test everything that we expected to happen with the system. With MongoDB, it's an open source database. The code I was working on was the Java driver, so that's the bit that talks between any JVM application and the, the MongoDB server. Um, so this is a downloadable jar file that people are using in all sorts of places, in all sorts of ways. We have no control, we don't even know who is downloading it or who is using it. We certainly have no control over what they do with our code. So it's a completely different beast to a financial exchange. The Java driver, we think, is the most used driver because it wasn't just used by Java programs, but also um, GORM and Grails and anything Scala, anything. The only driver that didn't use the Java driver under the covers was the Clojure one. But if you were using a JVM library or JVM language, you were using the Java driver underneath the covers of all of that. It was the oldest driver. It was the first driver to be written with, uh, in association with the server. It was written by the CTO, um, and it was kind of the, the launched driver, uh, which meant that um, it, it was getting on a bit. We learned quite a lot about um, what the driver needed to do. We had a much clearer idea of where the database was going in the future. So we kind of wanted to take those lessons and rewrite the driver. Now, the thing that worried me a little bit about that was we didn't have the sort of test coverage I had become used to. And if you're going to do a complete rewrite, I'd very much like to know that when I rerun the tests and they pass, that we've done the right thing. 
But if the test coverage is patchy, if it's not very high, if the tests are highly coupled to the code, it becomes very difficult to run a suite of tests to say, yes, you're complete, you've finished it correctly. So our tests were ugly. I'll show you them later. Um, inconsistent, they were very hard to understand. Uh, maybe I'm just stupid, but I'm quite happy for code to be written for stupid people to understand. And they were hard to understand. They were not exactly test first. I say test second, but I think they might have been <coughs> test after you've done everything else, then maybe write a test. Um, and because the tests were written after the implementation, um, they're very tightly tied to that implementation. So once a developer has written a particular for loop or a particular if statement, the tests rely on that underlying knowledge to test it. Um, and so, and they're also functional integration tests. So we have to spin up a MongoDB server in order for us to test the whole system, which sort of makes sense because the driver's job is to talk to the server. But I feel like there should be a place for unit tests in there somewhere. And the tests, because they were integration tests, because there's a cost to spinning up a server, to setting up the right environment, each test would often test more than one thing. So once you've inserted some values in the database, then we'll retrieve some and test that. Oh, but then we'll update some, and then we'll do this. So they're often testing more than one thing. They're often happy path tests because um, when you've written the code, you know what people should be doing with the code so that you write these happy path tests instead of writing the odd edge cases that no one's thought of. Most of all, the existing tests were not helpful for understanding the expected behavior of the system. They might be helpful for understanding how you coded or how you implemented the system, but they did not tell you, when I insert one of these things, I should expect to see this error or this success. So they weren't helpful for understanding how the system should behave. On the plus side, we did have tests. So that's a massive advantage over lots of places I've worked. But we didn't have a coherent approach to testing. So this is kind of what I wanted to fix. I wanted us to have a much clearer idea of how to write good tests and what our testing approach is. I felt personally very strongly that our tests should be readable not least of all because it's an open source platform, so the, co the code is readable by everybody. But I also felt like if someone had a question around, when I insert something that looks like this into the database, should I get an error or should I get some sort of success message? And I should be able to point those people to a test which says, look, this test proves exactly what should happen when you do these things. So I want these tests to be readable. I want them to be documentation for developers. We have a Java API aimed at Java developers, not a UI, not aimed at you know, um, someone using a phone. This is designed for developers to understand and read. This should be easy to write because uh, us developers are not super keen on writing tests all the time. So it should be as easy as possible to write. And I think it's very important they should describe the expected behavior of the system for some of the reasons I've just covered. So there are lots of different possible solutions. For example, in order to produce fast, possibly easy to understand tests, maybe we might go for a mocking framework. We might do our own mocking and stubbing. We could perhaps just be as simple as start writing good quality tests and start pointing people to those tests and saying, this is how you write tests. Um, we could create our own DSL. Uh, we could make more use of things like Hamcrest matches to write more powerful descriptive tests. I'm on the fence about Hamcrest. I think it can do some really interesting things, but I think readability-wise, it, it takes a bit to get your brain around it. Or some of my ex-colleagues at, at uh, LMAX had said, you should have a look at Spock, because it's amazing. And I, I was like, I, we write a Java library aimed at Java developers. I don't really want to introduce a brand new language just for testing. The same reason I don't want to do a DSL for testing. I want to use Java to test the library, to show Java developers how the library works. So I was quite resistant to using Spock because I didn't really want to introduce Groovy. However, I saw a talk about Spock and I thought it was amazing. So um, I, I fought for a week to do a spike. Now, um, who's done spikes before? 
Oh, cool, quite a few of you. Um, have you done proper spikes or did you do hacking some code and then someone puts it into production? <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> In theory, with a spike, you should have um, a question or possibly a series of questions to answer and preferably a small time box of time to do it in. So it's not just a case of playing with something and then going, oh, I quite like this, let's do this. You have to have specific requirements to meet. And our specific requirements, my specific requirements were, can I learn enough about Spock and Groovy in a week that I can be productive almost immediately? Is using Groovy, which is a brand new language I've never used before other than using Gradle, is that going to be too much of a context switch between being a Java developer in the production code, which has to remain Java, and doing Groovy development in the test code? What benefits does Spock give us over our current tests? It's not really that hard. Um, what benefits does it give us over other possible alternatives? Will it help developers write better tests for my definition of better? And most importantly, but most fluffily, does it make the test more understandable? So these are the sort of questions I'm, I'm trying to answer when I spend a week um, playing with Spock. OK, so I'm going to show you some code now, because you know we're developers, we like code. Um, this is going to be where I show the, um, the sort of general structure of Spock and some of the groovy-isms. So a lot of this will be familiar to probably many of you, but it's quite a good way to just get started. So let's have a look. So DB collection functional specification. This is kind of a really, a really simple example of one of the Spock tests that we wrote. This is probably pretty much all of our tests were more complicated than this. Um, and I don't normally put comments in here. That's just to remind me what I want to point out. So the first thing that I think is very weird is having this string method name. But for tests, this is fantastic because I can start really, yes? Oh, thank you. I knew that was going to happen. Uh, duplicate slideshow. That's better. Right? Can you read that at the back? OK, cool. Um, and you don't need to be able to read the comments. That's fine. So the first thing that's obvious to me is this um, string method name. So I can be more descriptive in what the test should do. Um, I can even put like more odd capitalization that you can't put inside um, method names. Um, and yeah, I just it was quite a good way of encouraging developers to write more descriptive test names. This given when and then of Spock, um, instead of using a test annotation, for me, this was actually one of the main selling points of Spock. Because what I wanted our team to do was to start thinking in terms of given, when, then. So this is the code I need to set up my test. This is the stuff I'm actually testing. And then finally, these are my assertions. Now, Spock has a bunch of different ways of doing stuff, but this was kind of the preferred way by default I wanted our team to start thinking about stuff. Um, and I'll show you why in a few, uh, in a few slides time. Um, and then we have some Groovyisms like the map syntax in, uh, in Groovy. MongoDB is a document <coughs> database, and documents look quite a lot like maps, certainly in Java. So using this map syntax is much more succinct. For example, here, where I've got an embedded document um, in Java, that would look like this. So there's just a lot more noise there. Now, ideally, this DB object, this method is taking a list of DB objects. Um, ideally, it would implement map. So all I have to do is this. But um, life never gives you what you want. So I have to force it into a basic DB object. But that's still a marginal improvement over, over using this sort of more verbose syntax. Um, what else did I like? Uh, I also liked the fact that when you're doing the assertions, you use double equals. So it's more descriptive. It kind of says, I expect to see, when I call this method, I expect to see it return to. It's just a little bit more descriptive than assert equals. And then the other thing I really liked about Spock was the way you deal with exceptions. So you can actually deal with exceptions with genuine assertions. So in JUnit, um, you would do something like test expected equals, uh, what's it, 
Mongo command exception. Okay, and then you don't have the then. But that's kind of weird because you don't have your assertions at the end. You don't sort of say, right, set this up, test this, and then something. Um, with Spock, you can not only explicitly say, I expect to see this type of exception thrown. You can also say, and I expect it to have this in the error message, for example. Now, checking for exact error messages is a bit fragile, but we didn't have a lot of flexibility because many of our error message many of the error message come from the server. So the server gives us a string, and we don't really know what that error is. So we're just checking to see if any of these strings um, are more or less what we expect. And often, if the server does return us a different string, then that is something we do want it to error. We do want that to change, to flag to us something has changed. Um, and the other thing around exceptions is explicitly saying when something isn't thrown. We used to have a lot of um, tests, and I'll show you one in a minute, where you would do something, but you wouldn't assert anything. And the test would pass, and you're like, well, that's great, but what are we asserting? And what we're asserting is that we didn't error, which is nice. Um, but here we can be much more explicit, and we can say, if you drop a collection that doesn't exist, I want to make sure that you don't throw an exception. This is a valid thing to do. Okay? So these are kind of some of the, the simple basics around Spock that um, were some of the reasons why we decided to trial it. Um, now I'm going to show you some ugly tests, because that's fun. So this is actually one of our rare unit tests. We don't actually have a server running in the background. Um, we didn't have very many of these. All this is doing is it's testing Mongo client URI. What the job of this thing is, is you give it a string, a URI, and it parses the different sections of those strings and then turns it into a more useful object around you know, authentication and what's the collection and what's the database. Now, the first few tests in this particular class, I think, they're kind of fine. Here's our example of expecting um, an exception. Um, here's an example where the test looks almost exactly the same. We don't expect an exception. What, what exactly are we testing? What we're testing is that we don't get an exception, but we're not explicitly saying that. Um, here we're testing a getter. Can anyone tell me why you don't test getters? I'm not going to go into that, it's a longer story. If you're testing a getter, you're probably just trying to up your coverage. And you're probably not testing, you should be testing things which will eventually use the getter, right? If, you, if your getter isn't tested, that doesn't mean you don't have a test called test getter. That means you're not using the object with the getter on it anywhere in any of your tests, okay? So test getter is a massive, massive smell. But anyway, so I deleted this test. Um, <laughs> And here's an example. This is very common in JUnit, and it's, it's not bad practice in JUnit. I'm testing a URI of a single server. I'm testing a URI which takes a database. I'm testing a URI which takes a collection. I'm not entirely sure why this tests these set of values, and the collection tests a subset of those values. But you know, at least I have separate tests testing different, different um, aspects, so, um, and that's fine. But then later on, apparently, we get fed up of writing separate tests for individual things, so we just put it in one test. Yeah. And um, for the most frequently asked question is, well, it's not really a big deal. We are testing username and password, so let's just test all the combinations of a username and password inside one test because it's easier. And the reason why you don't do it is, if this one fails, your whole test fails, and you don't know if it's just this instance which fails or if there's something fundamentally wrong with your parsing of your URIs. Okay, you've got no way of knowing if all of your tests are failing or just the first one. So that's why, certainly in JUnit, you have those in separate individual tests so that you know which things are really failing. Okay, so then we've got this. And then, uh, by the way, should we have a look at the actual test that we're class, uh, the class that we are testing? This is... Um, Ah, go away. This class is 300 lines, and that includes all of this Java talk. <laughs> okay. Um, 
so it's not a big test, it's not a big class that we're testing, but our test class <coughs> is 300 lines as well. <laughs> so there's, there's definitely a sign of a smell there. This might be the fact that perhaps our um, test is testing too many things or our class has a lot of responsibilities wrapped into it. Um, but it's, it means there's probably something wrong. So let's have a look at the Spock version of this. Oh yeah, there's another thing I want to show you. Uh, so here we do the expected thing and then here, um, here we're expecting an exception as well. But here we explicitly catch it and then put an, an, a message in there saying, oh, we expect this error. So this is another example of our inconsistencies. And it's not a big deal, it's just that it's a bit of a cognitive load trying to figure out the best way to write these tests. So uh, let's have a look at uh, Mongo client specification. Um, go up. So this is the Spock version of this test. These are the, these are the first two tests converted into Spock. Now, Argu arguably, they're actually a little bit longer because you've got your when, your then, and your nice spacing. But um, here, your, your test to make sure an exception is not thrown is really explicit that that's what you're testing. So those are kind of simple examples. But what really appealed to me about Spock is the, is the data tables, the data-driven testing. For us, especially for a class like this, where what it does is it's quite simple, but you're you have a lot of different potential inputs with a lot of potential different outputs. You end up with lots of tests or tests which test lots of things. With Spock, you do that with one of these. And so then you can shove in your different URIs and then you can say, well, I expect this to be this value, the database, the collection, whatever. And if I have a new combination I want to test, I just have to create a new line. Now, you might argue that that looks exactly the same as if I had a JUnit test, which has lots of different tests in it. But when I run this, if this one fails, all the others still run, so that I know that only what this one instance is causing a failure, or if they all fail, then I've broken something more fundamental. So that's kind of the key point for this test. So for, and the other thing is that for every one of these, I'm checking the host size, the host, the database, the collection, so I'm testing the same things on each one of those inputs. So I'm getting consistency, <coughs> and I'm remembering to test the right things on each one of those inputs. Um, and then I can use uh, the unroll um, parameter to give these different individual tests useful names. Um, so if, if you don't know about data-driven testing and unroll, then I would highly recommend it, because it's probably one of the main reasons we chose Spock over anything else. Uh, what else? Anything else interesting? And again, we just have these data-driven tests for all the different combinations. I still have a lot of tests in here, but at least they're grouped together. So I kind of understand that you know these are all authentication tests, the others are all right concern tests, and it's a little bit easier to understand. They're still not fantastic, but it's a big improvement. Um, so one of the things I wanted to test was, um, was mocking. Um, so I started trying to create mocks. We didn't do any mocking. We didn't have any unit tests. Uh, we, we used functional tests for everything. Um, so I created the first test which used mocks. And here I'm using jmock. I actually think mockito is a bit prettier, but I'd been using jmock and it, I was familiar with it, so I picked jmock. Um, and it's not the end of the world. I give it a string. Um, I, didn't, I didn't pick those things just for this presentation, by the way. I actually was learning Spanish at the time. Um, so what I do is I say, my expectations are that if you call encode with this list, then I expect the BSON writer to be called with these values in this order. So that's kind of, that's my expectations. JMark, it's a little bit weird because your expectations are before the actual thing you're, you're testing. It's a bit backwards, but you get used to it and you, you can kind of live with it. We did a lot of these tests at LMAX and it was fine. But it comes with quite a big cost. So I have to have this JUnit rule mockery 
Um, it's not clear to me at the field level which things are going to be mocked, um, which is the, the thing I'm actually trying to test, the thing I'm exercising. Um, I have to have this set up. This BSON writer is a concrete class, not an interface. So in order to mock that in JUnit, I have to set this imposterizer and this threading policy, um, and I have a load of things to import. I have to import JMock, JMock unit, JUnit, and JMock legacy, and it pulls in a bunch of dependencies, um, all so that I can do my mocking. So I was a bit unsure about this, and this is pretty much why my boss didn't want to do, didn't want to use a mocking framework, because he thought it was a lot of extra complications for very few gains. But then I showed him how we do it in Spock, and that just makes everything a little bit easier. So here, I can see my BSON writer is a mock, because I call mock. And that's all I need to do to create a mock, even of a concrete class. I have to put the right dependencies on the path, but I don't have to mess up my test class by telling it how to mock concrete classes. I can put this Spock annotation of subject, which is useful for documentation. It's not required, but it's a good way of saying, look, this is the thing that we're actually testing in this test case. Um, and then my given, when, and then are actually in order, and they actually declare what I expect. So given this string, when I encode it using this codec, I expect these things to get called on the BSON writer. Um, anyone who actually does mocking with Spock might notice there's a tiny thing that's implied that isn't correct here. So if I run this, well, hopefully it will run to begin with. That text is massive. OK, so if I run it, it passes. Um, but if I reorder those and run it again, it still passes. Now, in some cases, that's probably fine, because maybe what you're doing is you're placing an order in the shopping cart, and the inventory needs to be decremented, and an invoice needs to be printed, and the warehouse needs to be told. And it doesn't matter which order those, things ha those three things happen in. But in this case, I absolutely do want those things to happen in order. Um, but that's fine. I can still do that. It's just, it's just a bit of extra boilerplate. It's just something to be aware of in Spock. Um, it's OK, it's still readable, and the then basically implies it must happen in this order. But it's just a little bit more boilerplate than, than I was hoping for. So now if I put those out of order, now it fails, which is correct. OK, so mocking is easy. Uh, we should be able to stub as well. We didn't stub as much as we should have done on the Java driver. But if you can mock, you should be able to stub. So stubbing is, oh, what did I say stubbing was? DB cursor. So stubbing is just as simple as um, using the magic stubbing incantation. And then it will give you, when I call create on the factory, then it will give me the mock decoder. So then I can do my assertions on the, on the mock decoder. Um, that's kind of fine. You'll notice that this way around, um, Spock lets you mock either like this, or you can mock like this. Either way is kind of fine. Um, what, I, what we did initially is we did it this way around, because at the time, IntelliJ would then give you hints on what you could do on factory. So it gives, me the, it gives me the right methods that are available on DB Factory. Now, that was at the time. Now, IntelliJ is a little bit smarter. And even if I do it this way around, um, I get the right methods on, on the decoder. So even though it's a dynamic language, IntelliJ is kind of figuring out what types they are and giving you some of that auto-completion as well. Um, and that wasn't available a couple of years ago and is now. So you can do that whichever way around you like. This is probably, I don't know, it's a little bit prettier because it makes the yellow go away. But you can do it whichever way works. Um, so that's stubbing. How are we doing for time? OK. Uh, I talked a bit about Hamcrest. Uh, does anyone know Hamcrest, Hamcrest matches? A few of you. Um, so Hamcrest matches let you do slightly more powerful things. Specifically, I tend to use the contains matcher quite a lot. Uh, let me show you. Uh, let me find <coughs> out which one that is. 
DB collection. So here, um, what I want to do is, um, I want to check that the list of values that I get returned from a particular call contains some very specific entries. And, um, and that's just much easier with Hamcrest than, than with other things. So Spock supports Hamcrest if you want to use Hamcrest matches. A lot of the Hamcrest matches that I used to use, like is a or not null or null, you don't need anymore with Spock. You can do all of that out of the box. But some of the more powerful ones, um, you can still use them or write your own. So I wrote my own Hamcrest matcher, which is a JSON matcher because MongoDB returns strings, which is kind of JSON-y, but you can't do a string comparison on them because the white space is all wrong and your uh, apostrophes are all wrong. Um, so you can write your own matches and use them inside Spock. Um, I wanted to convert all of our tests to Spock because I was madly in love and I thought it was amazing and readable and brilliant. Um, so I was actually doing this conversion the week before last, trying to remember how to do Spock stuff because it's been a while. So let me show you the original. This is the original test. Uh, I don't expect you to understand this test because I spent half a day understanding it and I worked on this code. Okay, so <laughs> that's the point, is that some of these tests are quite complicated. It turns out that this test actually needs to be quite complicated because what it does is we have a particular type of cursor which sits there listening to new responses from the server. So this has to sit on one thread, kind of listening to the server, and I need another thread to start poking values into the database to make sure that they come back on this cursor. So it's, it's a little bit complicated and requires a little bit of coordination between these threads. So I spent a while trying to figure out what's going on here, and then I converted this to Spock, uh, DB cursor functional specification. And, and that's the same test in Spock. And it's pretty much the same code. I've done some things to improve it. Uh, so I get to use the great map syntax. So I've reduced a bunch of boilerplate there. Um, the Java driver is written in Java 6, so I can't use lambdas and um, I can't use lambdas and streams. So in my Groovy test, I get to use closures, so they can be a little bit smaller. Um, and of course, I get to say given, when, and then, and have a subject. So I'm kind of commenting the, the test to kind of show how it's split up. But ultimately, it took me nearly a day to convert this test, and it looks almost exactly the same. I think it's a little bit more readable, but this is where there really comes, you have to think about the benefits of investing that amount of time in understanding something, in playing with it, in figuring out if your new test does exactly the same thing as the old test, and is it worth it? And the answer is, if you're not ever going to touch this test or the functionality that it tests, probably not, because there's quite a lot of time invested in that. Um, I would like to point out one of the things that drives me insane about Groovy, though, because um, so far I've just said really good things about it. So I have a callable, which I decided to put in a closure so I could re remove my anonymous inner class. I put it into a variable of type callable, and then I submit it to an executor factory. Now, if I do it like this, Groovy's quite happy, um, but it tells the JVM that this is of type runnable, not of type callable. And then my test, well, my test actually passes, but it passes for the wrong reason, which is another reason why you write your tests first, make sure they fail, and then implement it. Um, so this kind of forcing stuff into the correct types can make the co conversion process between the Java tests and the Groovy tests a little bit painful. Because as you're trying to remove a lot of the boilerplate that comes with Java, you might be making some weird and unexpected changes to the behavior. Um, OK. Right. So in answer to uh, the questions that I posed myself at the spike, is it fast enough to learn that a week can give noticeable progress in, uh, in Groovy and Spock? And the answer is yes, because if in doubt, because Spock, there's not much to learn. Put given, when, and then in there, split things up into three bits, and if in doubt, just write it in Java. 
And this is one of the things which is quite a nice way of migrating Java developers over to Groovy. And just say, just write it in Java, and then as we learn together, we'll start doing better practice. I also introduced a tool called CodeNark to kind of tell us when we were doing really stupid Java stuff that would be easier in Groovy. So that was, um, that was quite a good way to learn. Is using Groovy to test Java too big a context switch? No, not really, um, because we're not that stupid. <laughs> It's, it's, quite, it's quite easy, especially if your tests start off kind of more Java-ish. Obviously, as I said, our team was a Java development team and we're a Java background. Um, but sometimes you really miss some of the groovy things in the Java code. Maps in particular. Maps is just so painful in Java. Uh, what benefits does it give us over our current tests? Readability, <laughs> a strong structure, sort of mocking and stubbing almost for free, and this data-driven testing, the, the data tables was by far the most compelling thing in Spock. Um, I hadn't used anything else which gives us that sort of functionality. What benefits does it give us over the other alternatives we were looking at? Well, the mocking and stubbing is much easier and it's much more readable. Um, we can still do some of those other options. We can still investigate them. We can still implement DSL if we want. Uh, and we can still use Hamcrest matches as well. So it doesn't close any doors for us. Will it help developers write better tests for my definition of better? Uh, yes. Given, when and then forces us to think, what is set up? What is the thing I'm really testing? What do I really want to see happen? And what are my assertions? Um, and which of my assertions are really important and which of them are just flung in there to make sure that my long test is prettier, I don't know. Um, what else? Better tests? Uh, yeah, well that's the main thing, the given, when and then. But also, they're kind of more readable with some of the succinct Groovy-isms. Does it make the test more understandable? Yes, exactly. So Groovy is, even for Java developers like us, Groovy is more understandable. There's, uh, it's much shorter. There's far fewer bits of boilerplate, which mostly as Java developers, we skip the boilerplate and just ignore it. It's fine until you start using Groovy and it takes it away completely. You're like, oh, that's much better. <laughs> so they're easier to understand. The structure makes it easier to understand. Um, and things like having full strings as the test names makes it easier to understand. Um, oh, no. So we get to kind of the point of this presentation towards the end, where are we? 10 minutes. Which is the best, Groovy or Java? This might seem to be a foregone conclusion given I've just spent the last 40 minutes saying how amazing Spock is. But it's not as simple as that. Because when you do a spike that's a week long, you get to see all the advantages of a new technology and all the stuff that's really exciting and cool. And it's really only when you start using something for any period of time, you just start to see any of the downsides. So it's the downsides I actually wanted to share. Firstly, let's talk about lines of code, because this is a useful metric. It's not a useful metric, OK? Lines of code-wise, Groovy is better than Java. You do need less, far fewer lines of code for things like closures. I mean, Java's better than it was. I think Java 8 makes things a bit easier to understand. Um, Lambdas definitely makes things a bit better in Java. Obviously, all of this is from my personal point of view as a Java developer. So there are no numbers or statistics behind this chart at all. It's just entirely my point of view. But I would say lines of code-wise, Java combined with JUnit is on the wrong side of, yeah, you know, it's all right. And Groovy and Spock is up here. I put Spock a little bit over here because um, with the given, when, and then specifically, especially when you want things in order, you get more lines of code. But we don't really care about lines of code. I hope we shouldn't care about lines of code. What we care about is how easy is it to understand the code. If you have fewer lines of code, it should be easier to grok, unless you're talking about Perl, in which case <laughs> it's an entirely different thing. But um, ease of understanding, I would put Java and JUnit squarely in the middle, especially as a Java person, because you get it. Okay, It's type safe, so all of your variables are a particular type, so you understand what they are. You kind of know what they should do. Your generics do have those stupid braces around everything. And um, you know you might not have lambdas. But I would put Groovy and Spock right up the other end in the very happy place. Because 
The tests are easy to understand. You've got given, when, and then very clearly set setting out what the tests do. You have a string method name saying exactly what the method should do. You have a lot less boilerplate around creating maps, around creating functions to pass around. Um, and you don't need semicolons where you don't need semicolons. I mean, now I've been using Groovy, as a Java person, I'm like, who cares about the semicolons? I'll just get my IDE to put them in there, and I don't care. But then once you go to Groovy and then go back to Java, you're like, all these semicolons, I just don't need them. <laughs> it's completely not important. Uh, ease of writing. I'm putting Java a bit further up here because um, this is largely to do with IDE support. But um, because it's all type safe, because you can do autocomplete for almost everything, Java is very easy to write with the right IDE. For example, IntelliJ IDEA. Um, <laughs> just saying, man. Um, JUnit as well, very easy to write because all you have to do is put a test annotation on the top of the method and then write whatever you want in there. I'm not saying you necessarily should write whatever you want in there. That's part of the problem. Part of the problem with JUnit is it's very easy to write whatever you want and you have to be much more disciplined <coughs> to write good tests. You can write short, succinct, understandable tests in, in Java, definitely. In fact, that example of the complicated Java code that I showed you, I rewrote it in simpler Java code, and it looks a lot like the, the Groovy test. The difference is that with Java, you have to be more disciplined to get the same results. Um, so ease of writing, I'm going to put Groovy and Spock right at the other end for the same reasons. I just don't have to type as much to get my maps, to get my tests to, looking the way I want them to look. Performance. I come from a financial exchange background. Performance is very important. But I'm not talking about performance in terms of sub-millisecond latency. I'm talking about when you run an individual test in your IDE and then it starts. It's a little bit frustrating. If you come to it straight from not having written JUnit tests, maybe you don't notice it. But from having written JUnit tests, which you run and then they're ready, especially unit tests that don't require any back-end database. The groovy thing of, oh, yeah, now I'll start, is quite frustrating for individual tests. When you run a whole test suite, that cost is amortized over the whole thing, so it doesn't matter that much. Our overall build time was not enormously affected. But for individual tests, uh, we found Groovy and Spock a little bit slow. Not, it wasn't a showstopper but it was noticeable. What was more of a showstopper is the performance of Java is more deterministic. It's more reliable. So we had some tests which had some funny race conditions. I personally believe we could have written the tests better to make them reliable in Groovy in terms of timings, but we didn't need to rewrite the tests in Java. They just ran in the order that we expected them to run in and the performance was more what we expected. So for some of our time-related tests, we moved them back to Java from Groovy. So uh, we still have a mix of Groovy and Java tests, and if the performance is important, we write them in Java. Fast feedback. I didn't really know how much to move this, so I moved it a little bit. Um, what I mean by fast feedback is, if you have um, a type-safe language like Java, when you do something really stupid like mistype a method name, which you don't do because you've got autocomplete and it fills it in for you, it tells you with the red <coughs> squiggly line, you've mistyped this method name, you idiot, retype it. In Groovy, you run the method and then it pauses while it compiles it into Java and then it thinks about it and then it tells you that you mistyped the method name stupid. And that's a little bit frustrating. I kind of want much quicker feedback than that. I want to know straight away when I've done something really stupid. My feedback loop is, if you've done something really stupid, know about it straight away. If you've done something a little bit stupid, you can have a bit of a delay. And if you've done something really subtle, then maybe it'll take a while before you get that feedback. But really stupid mistakes, I need to know about them straight away, because I'm not going to hang around and wait for that. Um, so mostly around um, the types, really, um, you get faster feedback from Java, plus it's a bit quicker to run individual tests. So for fast feedback, Java is better, but Spock is somewhere around the middle, so you can kind of let it off an awful lot of stuff. IDE support. So I work for an IDE company, 
So um, the ID support is really fantastic for Groovy. Um, it's definitely much, much better than it was. But IDE support for Java is very mature. I mean, these IDEs have been doing this stuff for a long, long time. And it is a little bit easier with a statically typed language like Java. With Groovy, it's definitely getting there and it improves release on release. Like two years ago, you, if you created a method that didn't exist, IntelliJ wouldn't let you create that method. Um, you know, you type collection.insert and the insert method doesn't exist. IntelliJ used to say, well, it's Groovy. You probably meant that. And I'm like, no, I didn't. Create it. I want to write my tests first. I want to create the API as I go. Um, IntelliJ now supports that, um, but it's, it's taking a bit of a while for it to support the things I want it to support. Um, ease of learning. If you're a Java person, I'd say Java's pretty easy to learn. And I'd say, <laughs> I'm just saying. Uh, if you're a Java person, Groovy is pretty easy to learn as well because you just carry on writing Java until you gradually learn some tips and tricks. Um, I would think, I don't know because I've been doing Java for more than 15 years, um, that probably Groovy is easier to learn as a beginner because it's more forgiving, it's more flexible, it's more readable. Java's got lots of libraries, lots of ways that you can kill yourself, lots of null pointers. Um, so probably Groovy might be easier to learn if you're not a Java person. I have zero evidence to back up that statement. Uh, right, how are we doing for time? Oh, we're pretty much spot on. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I'll put these slides up so it's not super exciting. Um, I guess one of the other main advantages of using Groovy in a testing wo way is that you can learn a new language without messing up production. Okay, so you could try it in a testing environment. With this is not part of the jar that gets bundled and downloaded on other people's code. So um, it's a much safer way of learning a new language, learning it in test. Um, yeah, I'd say our major disadvantage right now is that we now have at least two different ways to write tests, probably more. They were inconsistent beforehand, and now we've introduced Spock functional tests and Spock unit tests. So now we have inconsistency and another language because you always solve problems by adding a different technology. No, you don't, by the way. Um, right, so in conclusion, um, in my personal opinion, in our experience on the MongoDB Java driver team, Groovy and Spock are easy to read, easy to write, easy to learn. So just easier, generally speaking. However, Java and JUnit are well understood, very mature. Lots of people already know how to use these technologies. Um, they are statically typed. The performance is very good um, and currently better supported by the IDEs. Uh, finally, if you want any more uh, resources from this test, from this talk, uh, there's some resources at that URL. So specifically, there's a couple of blog posts about Spock. There's uh, a couple of links to videos about Spock specifically. Um, I think there's link to links to the code. If there isn't already, there will be. So, yes. Um, yes, that's me. I'm done. Is there time for questions? Yeah. Okay. Any questions? Stunned silence. Oh, yes. Not really, <laughs> but like theoretically, the yes. That, for example, like the data, data test will really help you. Mm -hmm. Would you advise, like, for the team that kind of starts with a new project, would you advise them to start talking with Spock before they kind of know which type of test they they gonna write? Okay. So the, the question is. Mine was not a greenfield project. I was doing translations of existing tests to new style tests. If someone was coming in without having tests on the project, would you, would you start with Spock tests? And um, I definitely would, because I actually think that um, that style, that BDD style of given, when, and then, makes you think about your requirements much more carefully. What is my criteria for setup? What is the thing I really want to test? And what are my genuine assertions? I would have liked to have done acceptance tests 
from the beginning without looking at any of our tests. So if I insert a document into MongoDB, then I expect this sort of response. Or if I insert a document with an invalid character, then what should I expect? Do I expect an error, an exception, or do I expect perhaps a return value which says false? Um, so I think that Spock kind of lets you think in terms of the behavior that you expect from the system. Whereas if you write JUnit tests, especially if you write them afterwards, you're just going to test what you implemented. You're not going to think about what the expected behavior is, in my opinion. <laughs> um, there was another question. Yes. You're, you're talking uh, towards the end about uh, the, the, the uh, performance aspect and Ruby not catching some horrible mistakes. Uh, have you tried the compile static annotation? No. That, that, that helps me a lot uh, to, to find when I you know, mistype something horrible. Yeah, I thought about using that, but um, I stopped working on the project. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I, the, the, what I didn't mention actually is the fact that the the dynamic stuff is an advantage and a disadvantage. So quite often, um, certainly at the beginning, I found it a massive advantage that you're like, I don't really care what these types are. But every now and again, it just bites you in the ass. It's really annoying. <laughs> Any more questions? Yes. So I originally wanted Spock to be just for unit tests because, because of the mocking and stubbing. And also that would give us that clean separation between our existing tests are functional Java tests, so we use Spock for unit tests. Um, but everyone loved Spock so much that they wanted to start using it for functional tests as well. And at first I was like, I don't want you. I, I want it to be very clear that Spock's for unit tests and Java's for functional tests. But my team had not been super excited about writing tests before, so I wasn't going to stop them from writing tests in whatever language they want to. Um, but it's fantastic for unit tests. We, we don't have any unit tests in JUnit. We only have functional tests in JUnit. Um, but the, we have functional and um, unit tests in Spock in different folders so that we know what they look like. No more time for questions. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>